you're going to be hearing a lot about a disease, uh, this symposium, a disease called coffee leaf rust. And it's, it's not a new disease, but it's a new problem in quality coffee production in the Americas, probably because of climate change and the shifting pattern of rainfall. The way that uh, fungi work, the fungi that infect plants, they start out as microscopic spores, see down in the corner there, and they need free water on the surface of the plant in order to germinate, grow a little bit, climb in through the breathing holes, the stomata of the plant, and cause an infection. So the more often a plant surface is wet because of rainfall, uh, the more often this cycle can go round and round and the more severe the disease gets. Now, you're going to hear a lot more about coffee rust, but my, my role here is to sort of put this into the perspective of diseases that have affected other crops. And basically all crops have pests, and some of them have very challenging pests. And also, like coffee, there have been events both historical and going on today where a problem that wasn't a big problem becomes a big problem, and that's kind of what coffee is facing. Apples in the United States are mostly grown in the Pacific Northwest, and it's a very productive area, but there has also been a, an industry in Northern California, and one of the niches of that industry was to be able to produce organic apples for a premium market. But again, probably because of the same phenomenon of climate change, the precipitation pattern has been shifting more from winter snows and rains into later spring and early summer rains. And a disease that never really was that much of a problem in California apple production called apple scab has become quite problematic. For a conventional grower, it's, it's not really that hard to manage that with uh, fungicides, but organic growers have a lot fewer options in that regard. Now, as you know, coffee rust has been around for a long time. This, this map shows when it arrived in various parts of the world. And that is also something that's fairly common among plants, that there are times in the cultivation of a crop when uh, it actually manages to sort of escape one of its pests, but frequently the pest catches up. An example would be potatoes. Now, potatoes are native to the Andes, and uh, they were completely unknown in Europe until they were brought back by Spanish explorers. And then over the next 300 or so years, it, it became a staple crop in Northern Europe, and particularly in Ireland, which is pictured here. Well, eventually a disease of potatoes made its way across the Atlantic somehow, and in the middle 1800s began to just completely decimate the potato crop in Europe, because for those 300 years, the varieties that people had selected and all that sort of thing was done without any attention to this disease at all, and they were extremely susceptible. It was a particularly a problem in uh, Ireland, where about a third of the population depended on potatoes for food, and it's estimated that as many as a million people died of starvation and another million people emigrated, all because of a fungus. Now, potatoes are still a major crop in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe, and that's because of fungicides. And I'll give you more about the history of that after I talk about another example of, of a pest catching up. The grapes of Europe that make the famous wines there originated in, in, pretty much in the Middle East and, and were selected o over centuries, really. And for a very long time, the grape variety that's going to be grown in each region has been locked in. And it's, you don't grow grapes from seeds, you, you clone them, you, you take cuttings or you do grafting. All of these grapes are in the species Vitis vinifera, and that's like the Arabica of the grape world. Now, in the New World, there are five or six species of native grapes. You're probably most familiar with the Concord grapes, that's Vitis labrusca. Maybe you've heard of Scuppermong grapes, which grow in the southeastern United States, and that's called Vitis rotundifolia. Now, these grape species had a disease called grape downy mildew. It's, it's actually somewhat related to the potato late blight pathogen. And it doesn't cause that much trouble on the Native American grapes. But the English, when they were in their exploratory mode, had this habit of wanting to bring back some of every plant from everywhere they went around the world to their greenhouses and their gardens. And in the process, they brought grape downy mildew to Europe. And when it got to the continent, it started devastating grape production there like in the 1870s. And it, it was a serious threat to the future of, of the grape industry. 
Now, in 1874, there was a fellow named Pierre Millardet, sort of an early plant pathologist, and uh, he was walking along a road in, in Bordeaux, and um, all of a sudden, he comes across a vineyard. All, all the other vineyards look terrible. They probably look worse than this. Today, we don't even ever get as severe as it was. When this disease gets bad, like all the leaves fall off the vine prematurely. And he comes on a part of a vineyard that looks great, and he wonders what's going on, and he finds the farmer and asks him. Well, it turns out that because the farmer was, his vineyard was beside the road, as his grapes would get ripe, people would come along and help themselves to some grapes. And he got tired of that. So, he went back to his shop and, and he came up with a mixture of a copper sulfate and hydrated lime and sprayed it on the grapes to make them look unappealing. I found a picture of it on, on tomatoes and that, that would make them look fairly unappealing. Well, he had accidentally discovered the first fungicide of the modern era and within a year, Dr. Miller Day was promoting the Bordeaux mix as the solution to grape downy mildew and it also moved in potatoes as well. So the grape industry in Europe to this day is very dependent on sprays for grape downy mildew and other diseases. But fortunately, they're not relying only on, on the Bordeaux mix because by modern standards, that's really not a very nice product. It's, it's somewhat toxic to people and it's copper is copper. It, it ends up in rivers and it's very hard on uh, aquatic microorganisms. It is, however, one of the only options available to organic growers. Now, obviously, you're not going to drive one of those fancy spray booths along this kind of coffee production. So there are certainly logistic barriers and there are economic barriers, perhaps, to the use of fungicides. But the truth is there really are some extremely safe and sort of environmentally responsible options available. And uh, still, that, that may or may not be the solution, but there are plenty of crops in the world that are only possible because of fungicides. Now, coffee is in a group we call rusts. They're actually more related to mushrooms than they are to other molds you might be familiar with, like bread mold or something like that. And most crops have a rust disease. They're all very specific to a crop. And uh, the most serious rust disease, probably for the food supply, is a thing called wheat stem rust. When the European colonists came to the New World, in Europe they had farmed wheat and that's what they expected to grow here and that worked well enough in the northern colonies. But in the southern colonies, because of this disease, you really could not grow wheat in, with the methods that they had available to them. That's why they ended up looking for other crops, ended up with cotton, tobacco that had high labor requirements and so a fungus had a role in the history of American slavery. Now, there's a, one difference between coffee rust and stem rust on wheat, which is some rusts have the ability to infect two different plants, and they do two different kinds of life cycles on those. So, like with coffee rust, it's called an asexual cycle. Spores infect, they go to another plant, infect just on the same crop, and there isn't a genetic change that goes on. The stem rust is able to infect this sort of nondescript bush called a, a barberry. And when it grows there, it goes through a sexual cycle, which means you have genetic recombination. And what that allowed this rust to do was very quickly overcome any resistance that breeders were able to find, just because it had this flexibility. So in about 1917, the USDA embarked on an effort to try to wipe out all the barberry bushes in North America. And uh, over several years, or many years, they probably eliminated something like 100 million plants and effectively denied the fungus this genetic flexibility. That combined with more sophisticated breeding from what we call the Green Revolution allowed people to come up with what they called durable rust resistance. And that was really one of the greatest contributions of Norm Borlaug, who, who's considered the, the man who fed the world made a huge difference in that time span. And for about 40 years, this resistance to stem rust held up and it really wasn't a problem for global wheat production. Then, in 1999, a fungus evolved and a new strain appeared in Uganda and it was now able to infect probably 70% of the wheat around the world and it was beginning to start spreading. Now, there's a very cooperative international breeding effort. People have already found new sources of resistance. 
but it's a big project to actually get this incorporated because wheat isn't just wheat. There are dozens of very specialized kind of wheats with very exacting quality requirements for the different things that you make from them. It's a huge enterprise to try to move this resistance into functional wheat varieties. Fortunately, something that was never available to Norm Borlaug back in the 60s is something called marker-assisted breeding. But instead of what Norm was limited to, where he could just look at the plants, make crosses, and look at the progeny and see what happened, now you're able to track the sort of the genetic fingerprint and know which, which genes have been moved, which genes do I need in this, how do I get my resistance and my quality. And so um, that, that is a a great new opportunity, particularly for a crop like wheat, that you can breed fairly rapidly. Now, some crops just don't have that kind of option. There's lots of different kinds of bananas in the world, but not very many kinds of bananas that you can pack into a boat and ship for two or three weeks to an export destination and not have a pile of black mush at the end. And so when the commercial export banana business started in the late 1800s, it was entirely dependent on a cultivar called the Gros Michel. That went fine for a while, but in the 1930s, a disease began to appear. This was one that infects through the roots. They called it Panama disease. It's a fungus called Fusarium. And once Fusarium is in the soil in a given place, you basically can never grow bananas there again, at least not the Gros Michel. And so the industry was actually being decimated. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a hit song called Yes, We Have No Bananas, and that's what it was about. Somebody found a banana in, actually a wild banana in um, Vietnam that could be shipped, and it happened to be resistant to that particular strain of fusarium. And so the entire banana industry was replaced with what we call the Cavendish banana. Well, turns out that there's a tropical race four, which uh, is in Asia, it's now moved to Australia, beginning to wipe out the Australian banana industry. If and when it gets to the New World, um, to the Americas, it could completely destroy the banana industry. So it's actually an industry far more at risk than coffee. So when you think about a genetic solution to a disease problem, that's the ideal, but many times that's not really feasible. You're not going to change which grapes you make fine wine out of, right? That's never going to happen. Potatoes don't normally reproduce through seeds, so they're extraordinarily difficult to breed. That's why a dominant potato today is still an over 100-year-old cultivar. Apples, people are breeding for other goals. Bananas, they don't have the option. Coffee is kind of in between. It's very unusual among perennial crops to actually be a crop planted from seed. Almost no other fruit crops are, are planted from seed. And so there certainly is the potential to, to breed coffee. It's just not fast. And it might be enhanced with marker-assisted selection. Now, there's one other way that people have managed disease problems. Uh, tomatoes are something that, in a rainy place, there's lots of diseases of tomatoes. But one strategy has simply been to move the tomatoes to a place where it doesn't rain in the summer. So that's why so much tomato production is in California or Mexico. Now, you don't always have that option, so the other alternative is some form of what people call protected culture. And that could be something as simple as a rain shield, just to keep the rain off the crop. It could be a little bit more elaborate, like a hoop house. This is the way that uh, a lot of, say, berry production is done in the eastern United States. It's, it's not a real expensive kind of greenhouse to put up, kind of temporary. Or there's the possibility to go all the way to a high-tech situation where you create whatever climate you want. And these have a huge capital investment associated, but they can be amazingly productive and very efficient, actually, even from an energy point of view, systems. Uh, now you do LED lighting and all that sort of thing. Um, I, I would admit that doesn't look nearly as romantic as, as a hillside in Central America, but uh, think about it this way. What if you were to put this on the roof of a building in, say, Boston, and uh, sell local Boston coffee? I think that could be interesting. So, Really, the, the, the whole perspective here is that coffee is facing a particular challenge right now with a disease. That's not unusual. Most of the crops of the world have disease problems, and these are not completely 
insoluble. The options are basically escape the weather, create your own weather, use fungicides, or do genetics. But that's really what it comes down to. I think it's really commendable that the coffee industry has already been investing in a lot of the basic homework to understand the genetics of coffee, to maybe be able to take advantage of some of these advances in terms of marker-assisted selection and things like that in the future. You join the chocolate industry in doing the same sort of thing, and if it's any comfort, cacao has a lot more pest problems than coffee does. So very few people in modern Western societies have any involvement in, in the production of the foods and beverages that, that we all enjoy or need. But somewhere, somebody is usually dealing with a pest problem to make these things available for us. I would just leave it on the note that we are still able to get most of these crops, and I'm sure there will be ways to do that for coffee in the future as well. Thank you.